Hey everyone, Gil Gross here, and it is time for another mailbag where I answer your observations, your hot takes, your questions, your inquiries, and ultimately your comments about tennis and other things. Last week, I posted on the YouTube community tab and on my Twitter, at Gil underscore Gross, where many of you left comments, and I responded to many of those comments last week where you can find part one of this mailbag. It was a very fun one. I encourage you to check it out if you haven't. This is part two, where I'm just going to pick up exactly where I left off. Same kind of recording session uh, where I'm going to uh, answer more questions. All right, uh, let us begin with Josh Ford. Gil, what are the potential matchups you're most looking forward to next season? Would love to see Djokovic Felix in a big hardcourt tournament. Yeah, I mean, we did recently get it in the Laver Cup. Novak's wrist was messed up for that match, so it was probably the worst match Novak has played since, I don't know, I don't even know, it, one of his worst matches of the season, not to take anything away from Felix. Uh, so, I need Alcaraz Djokovic. That's one of the first things that came to mind. We saw it once in Madrid. Alcaraz won. We definitely need to see that next year. There are a couple of rivalry matches, like grudge matches that, you know, have some drama there that I think will be very exciting to, to see again. I, I want to see Kyrgios and Tsitsipas play again. Now, I really hope that the match is less of, a, less of a mess than it was last time. I felt kind of embarrassed for both participants when they played at Wimbledon. But look, if, if I'm being honest, as much as I thought there was some really kind of pathetic behavior on both ends uh, during that Wimbledon match. I'd be lying if I said I would not be excited to see it again. <laughs> I would just, you know, there's definitely some heat there, and that's exciting. Uh, Rude Runa is another one of these really, like, unlikely dramas where you have some heat off court that always adds some intrigue. Uh, I want to see... Medvedev Rublev again. Now that Rublev has now won two straight, that's pretty crazy. Uh, you know, there continues to be some other interesting Medvedev head to heads. Uh, interestingly enough, you know, the Tsitsipas rivalry has gotten really good. The Djokovic head to head has been intriguing from the very, very start. Uh, you know, and obviously you want more Alcaraz Sinner. Now, how interesting was Alcaraz Sinner last year with uh, Yannick winning at Wimbledon and winning in Umaga, then having match point at the U.S. Open and Alcaraz really a huge sliding doors moments. Who knows who wins the U.S. Open if Sinner converts on uh, that match point. So yeah, I could go on, but those were all the first things that came to mind. Did that get you pumped for 2023? Stuart, Stuart B. Nadal 2023 or Fed 2017? Who had the better comeback season? I believe this was a topic that was going to be revisited when the season was over. All right, let's uh, let's pull this up. Uh, that's true. Somebody asked me this earlier in the year, and I'm like, wait, Nadal is not done yet. So let's wait until Nadal finishes the season, and then we will answer the question. Now, funny enough... Um, Nadal didn't really add to his resume, as far as I can remember, at the time that this question was asked. So I'm thinking, before I look at any of the numbers, I'm thinking that Federer's season was better. But let's see what we come up with here. So uh, Nadal wins two majors in 2022. And uh, so does Federer in 2017, right? He wins the Australian Open and he wins Wimbledon. So we are tied in majors. Let's look at overall titles. Federer in 17 with seven. Wow, uh, that that's that's crazy. I didn't realize that he won seven titles. That was the most titles he won since. 2007. My goodness. Okay, I think we know where this is going. Uh, Nadal won four titles. Uh, obviously, Federer in 17, you know, from a Masters 1000 standpoint, 
swept the Sunshine double. Nadal didn't win any Masters 1000s. I think we've already answered the question here that Federer's 2017 comeback was was better. You know, he won, let's see. I mean, Federer also won Shanghai. There's another Masters. He beat Nadal in the final there. Uh, Yeah. All right. I think we figured it out. <laughs> Federer was better. <laughs> Onward. Uh, Elizabeth. I am already waiting for Australian Open with great anticipation. The Netflix series about tennis that is underway would help. Do you know who is in it? Will it promote tennis as the series Drive to Survive uh, lifted F1 to an absolute high? Or will exposing the players be too much? Not exactly sure what you mean by will exposing the players be too much. Uh, exposing the players is going to be good. There's no doubt that it is better to expose the players, whether they come across as likable, unlikable, doesn't matter. Exposure is good. Uh, the question is, will people like to watch the doc? Like, that's what it's going to come down to. That is what I've been saying the whole time. Will people who don't like tennis, that's the key, like the doc? And if they like the doc, the same thing is going to happen with F1. You know, if if they like the doc, they're going to start watching tennis. I just think that is a natural progression there. Seems kind of like one plus one equals two. If the doc isn't good and there's no guarantee that it's going to be good, tennis is a different beast than F1. It's a totally different structure, different format, different kinds of characters. Like the doc might suck. Is it even a docu... I guess it is. Yeah, a docu-series, right? It, it could suck. And if it sucks, it's not going to help tennis as much. So that's what we're looking at. All right? I don't know what's going on. I think it's suspicious that it's been so quiet. I haven't heard anything. By virtue of having not heard anything, I don't think that this is going to be ready for the start of 2023 as it was... I believe, initially announced for the start of the 2023 season that they would have that out. I am dubious at this point that that is going to happen. From JC, Hey Gil, just wanted to say thanks for your awesome content. Thank you. I know you dislike the GOAT debate in terms of a single individual. Instead, you have talked about tiers. You have said that Rafa, Novak, and Roger would be tier one. Using this model, would anyone else make tier one? Who would make tiers two and three? And lastly, what bracket does Andy Murray fit into? Thanks. So in order for me to actually do this, I would need to spend a lot of time pouring over the history and the numbers and all of that. And uh, like, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not a historian, so I don't have this stuff at my disposal. Uh, but I will say other tier ones, I think pretty clearly, uh, Pete is another tier one. Uh, Borg is another tier one. Uh, I, I, I would have to ask about, you know, Laver and Rosewall. I'm not as familiar with where they fit in. Um, but I, I think those two are definitely, uh, up there with tier one list might end there. List might end there of the tier one. So you have the big three Sampras, Borg, and then maybe Laver, maybe Rosewall. I, I just don't feel like I, I'm, I have a good enough grasp on, on their careers in context. Uh, and I don't want to kind of go through the rest as much, but like, who would I compare Andy Murray to? I would say like an Andre Agassi who probably, you know, he put up better numbers Agassi did, but I feel like if you kind of subtract the big three factor, which really did hurt Murray's career way more than it hurt anybody else's. You know, way, 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 way more than it hurt anybody else's. It hurt Murray's. I feel like if you subtracted one of them, especially two of them, uh, Murray was looking at a maybe an Agassi-like career, which uh, is it tier two or tier three? Not exactly sure. Probably tier two if we're being completely, uh, I think tier two, but I'm not, I'm not firm on that. All right. That's all I got on that. Let's go to a Mugs Game podcast. Can you make a ranking of uh, top five ATP players who retired this year? Rank them. Okay, Federer 1, 
Sangha 2, Cole Schreiber 3. Oh, I forgot Simone. Hold on. Ooh, Simone versus Cole Schreiber. I think, I think, uh, I think Simone had a better career. Yeah, yeah. Simone definitely had a better career. Let me, let me check that. Let me just look at some numbers. I'm pretty certain that Simone had a better career. Let's see peak ranking. Peak ranking, Cole Schreiber got up to 16. And yeah, Simone got up to six in 2009. And then uh, if you look at like career win percentage, Simone, uh, 56%. Cole Schreiber, 54%. That's pretty close. So it looks like Cole Schreiber never won more than one title in a season. But uh, he did win quite a few. He won one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight titles by my count. I could be off by maybe one because I'm doing this quickly. Uh, and yeah, Simone has way more than eight titles. There's no doubt, no doubt about that. I got to five, uh, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. I have 13 titles for Simone. So uh, that leaves us at Federer, Sangha, Simone, Cole Schreiber, and then, uh, and then Stakovsky. From Yiv, predict how these rivalries unfold. Alcaraz versus Runa versus uh, Aliasim versus Sinner. Wait, I'm. Are we looking at Al Alcaraz versus Runa and then also FAA versus Sinner? I, I think that's what you're looking for here. Uh, who is going to have an edge over whom? Is it going to be surface dependent? Well, okay, Alcaraz Runa. I mean, I still give a slight edge at this moment to Carlos Alcaraz. I think in order for Runa long term to build an advantage over Carlitos, he's going to need to serve a whole lot better than Carlitos, you know, for a long time, you know, sustainably. I don't think that's abundantly clear. While while Runa's serve is a, a lot better right now, I don't think it's abundantly clear that that is going to remain uh, the case. Ali seems sinner. Look, I think Yannick is a lot more even. Do I think he's probably going to develop kind of similar serve plus forehand firepower to FAA? I don't know if his first serve is ever going to get to FAA's level, but it'll probably get decently close, honestly, uh, as the serve continues to improve quickly. So, you know, I kind of give a slight edge to Sinner long term, I think, over Felix. Surface dependency. Yeah, FAA on a quicker surface, center on, on slower uh, for the most part. Alcaraz, Runa, they, you know, I'm not so, I'm not so sure about them too. I think that won't be very surface dependent. I think they'll be pretty surface independent. From Sam Collins. Hi, Gil. What are some of the most inexplicably lopsided head-to-heads you've seen where two players generally are at a similar level, but for some reason one has the other's number? Well, there are a couple that are fresh in my mind from this 2023 season. The first is 100% uh, Dan Evans versus uh, Yoshihito Nishioka. Uh, it is 6-0 for Nishioka. And while some of that perhaps can be explained by Evans's slice backhand going in, you know, cross court going into Nishioka's forehand. I mean, they're pretty much the same level. If not, you could make a probably a pretty good argument that Evans is the better player and he's just down 6 0 against Nishioka. That's a little, that's a little wacko. And then you also have uh, Laszlo Gera and uh, Lorenzo Musetti, which has been, you know, a, a kind of a, a 250 rivalry this year. They've played already a ton. They've played already seven times. And like, let's face it, Musetti just got onto the tour. So the fact that they've played seven times is a little bit nuts. And Jera keeps beating him. Jera is up 5-2 in that head-to-head, -head, which is kind of weird on Musetti's part that he doesn't, that he hasn't been more competitive against Laszlo Jera. So those are the two that come to mind. And I love it how on this mailbag we've gone from like talking about like Borg, the big three, and Sampras to uh, the Jera Musetti head to head. That's what it's all about. 
All right, here's one from Austin, kind of a left turn. I like these questions on the mailbags, though, occasionally. Uh, what would you rather watch, an MMA pay-per-view with a, with a champ you like headlining or a Masters 1000 with two players you are high on? So throwing aside the fact that it's not really a choice whether or not I watch tennis like I have to, uh, putting myself in the shoes of a fan, I still feel like there is nothing that can compare to a really, really big prize fight. I don't think tennis can ever compare to that because when there's a super big historic prize fight, whether it be boxing or MMA or, I mean, those are the big ones right now, let's let's face it, you get the feeling that once this happens, you'll never see it again. There's no way you're ever going to see it again. There might be a rematch. There likely won't be. But even if there is a rematch, there probably won't be a trilogy. And if there's a trilogy, that means something pretty awesome happened. That means you have, you know, two top level guys, top, top, top level guys who, you know, because otherwise whoever wins just keeps going up and they don't fight again. Uh, it usually means you have two championship level fighters who have split the first two fights and now we're going to do a third. So regardless, like, major, big, big, big fights, they just have this weight to it that I don't think a tennis match can ever have because, yes, while matches stand alone on by themselves, you know, there will never be another 2022 U.S. Open final. That is the last time. That is the only time we will see it. And there, there's a sense that, okay, we are going to see these players play again very soon. Fighters fight like once or twice a year. Right, there is a sense that we could even see them play uh, in the same head-to-head -head very soon. Uh, so you just don't have that enormous kind of uh, special feel to it. Also, the build-up. Anyone who's a big fan of combat sports, they care about also. Usually, they care about the build-up, where you have you know all this promotion and this anticipation and the interviews and the media and the press and. It all just kind of builds to that one moment. And tennis doesn't have that. In tennis, it's like, oh, hey, uh, these two are playing. I learned that 24 hours ago because they both won their last matches. So uh, there you have it. It would be like, yeah, like it would be like if we knew that Nadal and Djokovic were going to play on December 25th. On December 25th, they're playing. And like if that was the case, People would be asking me in my mailbag two weeks before, Gil, what do you think that December 25th Nadal-Djokovic match? I can't wait. So it's a totally different thing. From Brandon. What is Kasparud's peak? Tennis-wise and star power. People say he's boring, personality and game, but I feel if he were to win a US Open, he could possibly be boosted into stardom. Well, I don't think he needs to win the U.S. Open. I think there are a lot of things that could boost him into stardom. Uh, a couple things. First of all, in terms of Rude's personality, I maintain that he is low-key funny, really easy to like, pretty charming, um, and I don't know, like, <laughs> like I, he, he's certainly not going to be a personality that elevates his stardom beyond what his tennis allows him to do. So there are a couple categories, right? We've seen a guy such as, the best example is Nick Kyrgios, a guy whose tennis, whose, whose stardom actually surpasses their tennis because of the personality. Then we see some players whose stardom is below the level of their tennis because of their personalities, because maybe they're boredom, uh, because, you know, there's a, a maybe a boring factor to them. Uh, let's say, let's call that Pete. Let's say Pete Sampras was that guy where like, it was just kind of hard to be super passionate about Pete Sampras. Rude is definitely in between where his personality is not going to hold back his star power. I don't think it's going to elevate his star power, but let's just say this, like, if Casper Rude had a, and this is out of the question, but if Casper Rude had a Roger Federer career, I think Rude has the makeup, the personality, the marketability to be pretty close to like Roger Federer level. 
Uh, is that a total bold statement? Is that a total crazy hot take? Uh, to me, he has that polish to him and that charm to him. So I don't know. I don't think he's boring, and I don't really think his game is boring either. But, I mean, one thing he definitely needs to do is get better. Like, he needs to play better uh, because certainly, you know, in the big finals that he's gotten into, he hasn't really made any casual fans by, you know, piquing anybody's interest with his ability to compete hard in those matches. So, you know, he definitely needs to elevate the tennis to elevate the stardom, but that's true for everybody. I hope I answered the question there. I guess I gave kind of a nuanced answer, not a very hard line answer. Next one is from Davis. Uh, sorry, David. Next one is from David. Hi, Gil. Lorenzo Massetti, Jack Draper, Ben Shelton, Dominic Stricker, Luca Nardi. These are the five players under 21 who are outside the top 20. Well, there are more players outside the top 21 outside the top 20, but I, I get what you meant. If you were to invest in them and your careers, rank them in terms of how likely they'll improve in the next year. I'm going to keep Nardi out of it. I want to see more. Um, but so basically, Draper's the most complete. Shelton and Stricker are the firepower guys. Musetti... Musetti of the bunch is the purest baseline or the purest ball striker, which tends to be, I guess, I don't know, the one of the best bases you can build a game from. You know, the, the timing that he possesses, I don't, you know, that kind of thing maybe you can't teach, but uh, it's not Musetti, to be completely honest. It's going to be either Draper or Shelton. I think Shelton's a better athlete than Stricker, just a better natural athlete than Dominic Stricker. So... You know, while they have similar firepower, they have the big serves. I think Shelton, in terms of uh, his combination of, you know, explosive movement and strength, I think it's pretty special. But Shelton versus Draper, that's a tough one. From what I've seen, Draper, here's the thing. I haven't really seen Shelton play against that many tour-level players. Uh, I know he he had some, you know, we definitely saw him, like I saw him against Rude in Cincinnati. You know, he's had some big results already, but I've just seen a whole lot more of Draper. And I know that Draper has very few flaws in his game, you know, and there's just a lot to like. He just needs to make sure to keep developing the weaponry, especially on the forehand, and, and he is off to the races. So it's close between Draper and Shelton. I'd probably go Draper. Next one is from I Love Tennis. What's the word? Do you think Wimbledon is going to ban Russians and Belarusians again? I'm really hoping you're you're all hearing that this will be a no in 2023. Hard to see how anyone thinks that that was a smart move. So I'm not hearing anything, but I'm willing to speculate on this. My hunch is that, first of all, the All England Club's hand was forced by politicians. That so much is clear. And I said the same thing about the Djokovic Australia situation at the start of the year with, you know, the whole immigration stuff. Ultimately, what, you know, the reason Djokovic was, for lack of a better word, and I'm just going to be black and white here, the, the, the reason why he was screwed over by the immigration minister who used executive power is because the immigration minister f felt that that was a popular decision and was probably correct about that. You know, the way the Australian public was responding to the whole saga, uh, he made a popular decision. So with public support, politicians are going to, you know, make those kinds of decisions uh, because they're trying to be popular. All politicians are trying to be popular. Um, I think, I don't think that the backlash that the All England Club and that the, the British government received for that decision— I don't think they anticipated that. I thought they were like, oh, I didn't realize. And I don't think they'll do it again because I think they heard the critics. I thought they were pretty much, look, I know that some people supported what they did. I think they were pretty much universally panned, criticized. And I just think they have, 
in all likelihood taken in that feedback and now it's the now it's just the reverse logic. Politicians don't want to do stuff that makes people mad and is unpopular, so I think they will reverse course on that. From Road to Dawn, who are some of your favorite tennis content creators on YouTube? So I, I will be honest, and I've said this before, I I am a YouTube viewer, uh, but I don't watch tennis stuff on YouTube. Uh, I watch cooking stuff, and I watch music stuff, <laughs> and I don't watch, I watch uh, some sports highlights of, of tennis and non-tennis, but I actually don't um, view a lot of contents. But I'm going to give some shout outs here. I will give some shout outs. Um, shout out to Steven at the Slice, who awesomely was in Europe all summer, and I'm going to have him on the channel. I want to talk to him about this experience, you know, going from tournament to tournament, doing that hard work on the ground. So shout out to him. Uh, shout out to Game to Love. Uh, love those those guys. JG and Ben are uh, tremendous, tremendous uh, lads, I want to say. Uh, very funny and uh, super great time, and they do good stuff. Uh, shout out to, um, what's it called? My goodness. Uh, I shouted out both of these uh, last week, or not last week, but I think, yeah, I think in the last mailbag I did. Uh, Baseline Media, who, full disclosure, I work for, and then uh, Cult Tennis, um, who does, you know, long-form stuff. Shout out to Tennis Nerd, who does a lot of uh, racket technology, string technology stuff. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, they're very sharp, very smart. That's really good content. In a more corporate sense, you know, Tennis Warehouse does that stuff pretty decently as well. Uh, but yeah, that's more corporate. I think that's it. Sorry if I missed anybody. Oh, shout out to Quality Shot. I go on uh, on his channel a lot. Faison, he's great. Shout out to Cracked Rackets. I also work for Cracked Rackets. Uh, now, you know, that's a completely different story. Like, you'll see a lot of college tennis stuff on on their page. If you're an, if you're an American college tennis fan uh, or any college tennis fan, I don't even think I need to tell you this or plug this, but, you know, obviously go to Cracked Rackets for all that stuff. And, of course, some... Uh, all the, all the Alex Gruskin content that you could ask for is right over there. A couple more here. Here's one from Jason. Did the GOATs ruin the tennis schedule by showing the race for majors is the one to win? I don't look forward to non-majors as much as I used to. I think Nadal or Djokovic could make a deep run no matter their seed. Uh, well, I don't really get the last sentence. I don't know what you're getting at, but that's a fascinating point. I wonder if there has been an effect of that where, I mean, when they were young and energetic and more physically dominant, it did feel like the masters, they were kind of going at it. Uh, and you kind of had that, those classic kind of big three, even big four dynamics going down all the time where now it really feels like we're only getting that at the majors and you know, maybe that has skewed the way we look at tennis, but like ultimately, I think when youth takes over again at the top of the sport and we are like, you know, super ultra excited, uh, even more than we already are about, let's say, Alcaraz Sinner, and, you know, they, they will be just like the big four w were. They will be going all out at these Masters events and, you know, maybe even, you know, lower tier events. And uh, it'll be it'll be just as fun, but uh, yeah, I think that's a really fascinating point. Maybe there has been a lull um, in the sub major category because of kind of how Nadal, Djokovic, Federer, uh, and even like Serena uh, have in the latter stages of their career approached their scheduling and their energy conservation. Here's one from MMA fanatic. I will assume. That stands for Monday Match Analysis Fanatic, even though you have the UFC logo in your bio. From what uh, from what you have seen so far, what is Radu Kanu's upside? I honestly think she is as talented as Iga. She is by far the better serving and even returning, and I would say Iga has a stronger baseline game and more powerful forehand, but with time, Radu can improve it. I think even comparing those two at this point just doesn't make much sense. I mean, Iga is so far and away beyond Raducanu when it comes to results that it's a it's a near impossible statement to make I think the one that you just made um 
But like what Radu Kanu needs to add to our game is uh, is muscle. I mean, the the reality is with Iga, not only is she stronger and does she just hit bigger, but she's also a lot faster and a, a more nimble athlete. So she she covers the court better better and she hits bigger. Uh, Radu Kanu needs to be more imposing physically. You know, she needs to build up her body to where she is, I think, a little bit quicker around the court. And obviously the biggest thing with her is going to be injury prevention. You know, that's the biggest reason she needs to get stronger. Uh, and then I think she made some good progress at the end of last year, going after her serve more, going after her ground strokes more. You know, she's got really good timing, amazing technique. Um, she hits very clean. She needs to take take all of those good qualities and translate it into more power and and muscle, strength, aggression. So there's a, a lot of work for Raducanu to do uh, before she she gets to Iga's level. From Adrian. Uh, Hi, Gil. Have you considered more list-type content? You already did sort of a top three players to watch last year, but I think a few people would love to see a video like top 10 matches I've seen live or something similar. Yeah, you know, that, depending on how the offseason goes... I might do uh, something that one of one of my favorite YouTuber does. I kind of do like a list week uh, and do a bunch of lists all week. You know, that could be an off season. That could be something on the agenda for the off season. Let's see. You know, we have the thing is the off season is so short that I don't feel stressed at all about keeping the content going, uh, which is kind of funny because you would think. And first of all, it's very bad to stop posting content like the algorithm will kill you. Um, so as much as I also care about you guys, I want to keep, you know, keep active and all that stuff. Uh, it's, it's a really bad idea as an internet content creator to ever like go dark for a long period of time. Um, anyway, yeah, I, I'm not stressed about it at all. Cause it's so short. Like I know this month is going to fly by. There's plenty to talk about. I have a lot of fun ideas that I'm super excited for. So yeah, uh, I might do lists, but it's just about how things play out. This might be the last one. Yeah. Yeah, this is the last one. It is from Karen. It's a long one. I've done a lot of Medvedev content recently, including the last mailbag, but this is just a really uh, good observation, a really good question, so I wanted to cover it. Gil, I remember you saying that Medvedev is at his best when he is the most patient and consistent player in the world, which I agree with. However, I also think that when he is most difficult to beat, he is one of the most unpredictable players in the world. When he goes into mad scientist mode, as you have called it, and is inventing new shots, he's had his best runs. Examples are the summer and fall of 2019, Paris and ATP Finals 2020, when he would spontaneous, spontaneously charge up to the net, and the Vienna title run la this year, where he unexpectedly hit drop shots from no man's land several times. Saying all of that, I think Medvedev's unsuccessful summer can be largely explained to him being way too predictable, such as the U.S. Open against Kyrgios, where it seemed in the rally, Kyrgios knew from neutral it was just going to come back cross-court. What do you think? Also, I kind of think that Medvedev hasn't reached the same level since his win streak from 2020 was ended in the Australian Open 2021 final. I know he won the U.S. Open later that year, but somehow his creativity and X factor went down. Lastly, since Medvedev is actually a pretty streaky player, I think he's going to have a great 2023. Thanks. All right. Look, I I had forgotten about this, and it is such a good point. It is such an excellent point that uh, Medvedev had a... Look, it's very simple. Here's the word. I might have called it mad scientist mode. Fearlessness. Fearlessness. The only reason Federer could saber, the only reason Medvedev in that U.S. Open final against Nadal could start charging the net without good volley technique, just make it work, is because he had a wild, you only live once, fearlessness, where things just would weirdly work out for him. You know, that is why he could hit two first serves against Djokovic. Uh, in Cincinnati 2019, and it worked because this guy just had this, he was in this mode 
of invincibility where whatever he tried, he just believed in. And he would just, you know, pull crap out of his behind all the time. You're totally right. That is gone. But at the end of the day, I don't know if that ever comes back. Because when you start to feel expectation, when you start to fear, feel pressure, fearlessness, man, there's not a lot of players who actually have that. Most players have fear of losing. Almost every player does. And you can like hit a point where you're not fearful of losing. And usually what happens, you become a world beater. Federer in 2017, Nadal in 2022, we talked about this a ton at the beginning of the year. They came back from injury and they just didn't fear losing. They expected to lose. And what happened? They were unbelievable. So Medvedev definitely had that. And he'll never have that again, probably. But it's a super good point about, you know, some of Medvedev's best moments. He had these qualities. Now, does that mean that he shouldn't try to somehow take some of the things that he was doing at that time and implement them and become unpredictable again? No, I mean, I think that's a fair point. You know, maybe he needs to make a concerted effort to try to channel some of those things again. Uh, but I also think that it's reasonable to believe that it's going to be hard for Medvedev to ever do that again uh, to, the, to the same extent. Maybe he can get halfway there. That is all I got. This was a lot of fun. Amazing comments to end the year. Um, the next mailbag is going to have a focus. Um, we've talked about uh, most underrated shots, so I believe it's time to do most overrated shots. Uh, get ready for that next week on the mailbag. Hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you next time.